Hey guys, welcome. I'm Brandon. In case you don't know, attributes are what you enter in square brackets, often before variables, or above classes or functions in order to add some really awesome functionality to them. And they are essential to keeping your scripts organized and clean in the inspector. And I want to show you a list of all of the most useful built-in attributes that I have found. And at the end, I'm going to show you two additional tools that will give you access to hundreds of attributes for some features that you've probably always wanted. And one of them is completely free, so stick around to the end. Ready? Let's go. Have you ever tried to find decent indie game dev gear? I have, and there was not a whole lot of good options out there. For years, I actually resorted to having Nikki make it for me. So if you would like a way to support the channel and get some of that hard to find clothing that speaks to your game dev soul, check out our awesome new merch shop. From cozy hoodies to pixel perfect tees, our gear is designed for and by passionate developers like you. Support the dream, wear the passion, and join us on the indie journey. And if you check it out now, everything is 15% off until January 29th. So first on the list is the color usage attribute. By default, when you select a color in the inspector, you'll have the option to change the alpha, but not the intensity of the color to easily add bloom and things like that. Stick this little attribute in there and you have the option to toggle both the alpha and the HDR on your color variable. Next is the gradient usage attribute. It's very, very similar to the last one. By default, you have no option for HDR when you set the color for gradients. Add this little attribute above or in line with the variable, and you'll be able to turn on HDR for the colors. Although there is no toggle to turn alpha off for gradients here though. A lot of tutorials out there, including this one in my previous two points, will use public accessors to get variables to show up in the inspector. But this isn't really the best practice when you're working on a proper game. If you only need it to be editable in the inspector, but you don't necessarily need access to get or set this variable from other scripts, then you'll want to put the serialized field attribute before your private variables. And if you already have an attribute before the variable, just throw in a comma and you can add a second attribute. This is an obvious one for a lot of you, but I managed to learn game development for almost an entire year before finding out this attribute even existed. So I just wanted to put it out there because this is a very important attribute for good game architecture. On the flip side, if you have a public variable, but you don't need it to show up in the inspector, you can put the hide in inspector attribute in front of it. You'll still be able to get and set it from other scripts. It's just not going to show up in the inspector. Now, of course, you could argue that in my previous example, you could just make it a property and use the getter and setter on there. Doing that makes it not show up in the inspector either, and it gives you the bonus of being able to control the access level of both the get and the set, which is really awesome. But sometimes you will want a property to be available in the inspector, and if that is the case, you can put the field serialize field attribute in front of it. That is going to make it show up in the inspector. So a really nice and simple easy one if you don't want your number to go below a certain threshold is the min attribute. Just type in the minimum value and you literally will not be able to drop the number below that value in the inspector. Now because of the previous one you'd think there would be a max function but there is not. The next best thing though is the range attribute which lets you set both a minimum and a maximum at the same time. And it ends up appearing as a nice slider in the inspector. If you've ever used an enum, but you didn't necessarily like the names you chose for design purposes, you are in luck. There's an attribute specifically for enums, and you actually insert it inside the enum, and it's called inspector name. Just type in how you want the name to be displayed here. It does not change anything when you reference this in code, but it can pretty up your display in the inspector. If you've never heard of this one, it is going to be your new best friend because it is way, way too easy for things to start getting cluttered in the inspector when you have too many variables. And fortunately, there is the header attribute for this. You just type in a string and it's going to insert some bold text and a little bit of space above the variable. In the interest of keeping things organized, the space attribute might interest you as well. I see this used a lot, but what I actually didn't know for a long time is you can pass in an argument here. And what this actually is, is the amount of pixels of space that it's going to create. You might be able to relate to setting up some vague or really complex name with your variables that makes sense to you at the time that you set it up. But when you come back to it in the future, you have no idea what that variable is supposed to do. Tooltip comes in handy for this. Enter a string and you'll be able to get a little description whenever you highlight over top of the variable in the inspector. 
Inevitably, at some point in development, you'll need to enter a string in the inspector. But it's not really nice by default because there's not really much space to work with. You're going to want to use the text area attribute for this. There are two arguments to pass in here, the minimum lines and the maximum lines. The minimum lines you can see create literally just a minimum number of lines that it will not go below. What the maximum does is it doesn't limit the amount of new lines you can actually enter, it only limits the size of the text area box. So since I entered 10, once I go beyond 10, it's going to turn into a scroll bar instead. Maybe you're like me and you've completely blocked out this little question mark and you hardly notice it's even there. But in case you didn't know, for components, you can click on it and it'll take you directly to the documentation page for that component. But for a script that you created, you're just going to get an error page on the Unity documentation website. That's because you need to point it to something using the help URL attribute, which goes above the class. Maybe you grabbed a script from a certain GitHub repository or a YouTube channel, and you might just want to be able to easily reference that again. Just plug that in into that attribute, and now when you click that little icon, it'll take you right to that page. A good habit, especially if you're using inheritance and setting up base classes for things, is to use the require component attribute. It'll make you enter a type in here. And now whenever you drag this script onto a game object, it's automatically going to add that component. Bonus tip though, the reset function actually gets called whenever a component gets added to a game object. So let's say for example, you want this to be a trigger when you add the script to the game object. Just get a reference to that in the reset method and change it to a trigger. Now whenever you add the script to a game object, it's also going to add a trigger circle collider 2D as well. If you have a parent game object with lots of child game objects, trying to select what you want can be really annoying. For example, I just clicked my player, but it selected his scythe instead. Now my player has this player script attached to him, so if I add the selection base attribute, now whenever I click anywhere on my character, it will always select him first. And if I click that same spot again, now it will select the closest child object. If you want a quick way to be able to test a function from the inspector, you can add the context menu attribute above the function, and you plug in a string there, which is how it will appear in the context menu. So back in the inspector, now if we right click the script, you will see the string that we typed in, and if you click it, it will run that function, which in this case, it just applies a random amount to our float. On the other hand, you can also add the context menu item attribute in line with the variable instead of above the function, type in the display as a string, and then the function that we're going to call also in a string. This is going to do the same thing as the context menu, except we can right-click the variable instead of the script. And again, clicking that will run the function. Now, while these attributes are awesome, the list of built-in attributes available are a little bit underwhelming. There are a huge number of things I've always wanted to be able to do easily with attributes, like being able to easily add a button with a quick attribute above a function, which I would highly prefer to the context menu attribute, or actually having a proper min-max slider built in, being able to assign a tag based on a dropdown instead of a string, actually being able to hide or show certain inspector elements based on conditions, meaning only show this if this bool is true having data validation to make designing your game easier, or even just having more organizational elements at your fingertips, like lines, info boxes, actually showing you an asset preview when you drag it in, having these nice shaded box groups, or expandable foldouts that can easily be added. At this point, I expect the reason Unity does not build these into the engine is because all this stuff is already available on the asset store, and them putting it into the engine is going to make a whole lot of people's past purchases a waste. Or maybe they just don't feel like it. I honestly have no idea. But literally all those awesome attributes I just showed you were directly from a completely free asset from the asset store called Naughty Attributes. I have been using it, and it's really, really awesome. And I'll leave a link for that down below in the description. But I do also want to show you the Odin Inspector in the Asset Store. This is a verified solution, which means that it's been thoroughly tested by Unity, and you can be insured of long-term dependability with this asset. This thing offers over 100 attributes, but it also gives you really powerful data validation and serialization capabilities. It is usually on the best-selling list of assets for a reason. And a little tip, it usually goes on sale for 50% off a couple of times a year, so if you don't want it right now, you can wait for a sale. But if you do happen to purchase this asset from the link below in the description, we get a little kickback from that, so it's a nice little way that you can support the channel. 
But another free way that you can all support the channel is to hit that like button and leave a comment down below. I would specifically love to know if anyone already owns the Odin Inspector asset and if you just want to tell me about your experience with it. I don't own it yet, but I am very interested in buying it, so I'd love to hear about it. And also, if there are any attributes I missed that you think were worth mentioning, let me know down below as well. You can also wishlist my game, Samurado, on Steam, which is what you're seeing on your screen right now. That's all I got. Check out this video for more Unity tips.